Okay, so if everyone could go to your desktop, I've got a document, I've got a link for you on my network folder here. So if you open up computer window, and then you go to the classroom data drive Z, if you're on your own laptop, unfortunately you don't have access to this, but it's not a big deal if you don't. If you do have, if you do get into this on our computer, that'd be nice. So classroom data, and then scroll down to find our class folder, which is Campus Advanced Google. Open that folder. That's where I gave you the syllabus a long time ago, remember, uh, which is still there. And I've got this document called Shared Doc. Uh, copy that to your desktop just so that you can open it. Copy to your desktop and then open the file. And then there's a link. Follow that link. So copy that link and paste it into your web browser. So get that shared doc. Take this link here. Go back to your web browser and then paste that link to follow it. So that's a collaborative document that I gave everyone. I am the originator of that file. I'm looking at the file right here, and I'm seeing people logging into my file. Anonymous monkey, anonymous fox. Oh, wow, you can see people uh, active. Yeah, at this very moment. So you guys hear anonymous buffalo, giraffe, monkey, otter, grizzly, crow, coyote. If you, if you log in, I'm not sure why it doesn't show your name directly. You're probably logged in, but if you're not logged in, click on the top right corner to log in. doesn't matter, really. But anyway, here you are. I've given everyone access to this document in this room. People are already following along here, so I've got here, hello. Press Enter at the end of the document. Add your name and one interesting thing about yourself. So let's give this a try. Just go to the very bottom. Try not to step on each other's toes, but go to the very bottom, press enter a few times, and stake your claim yeah. at the bottom. Yeah. You gotta be quick with it. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. So, here we have this collaborative document where everyone can Anonymous. get into it. Anonymous wow. And you have. Just copy it from the desktop. Open it on, uh, yeah, just copy that link from, from my file into your browser and you should have access. So here everyone has access to this file, and um, you have the ability also uh, to go in and change fonts and sizes and everything. You know, I can go in here and change that on mine. So you all have this ability to collaborate on this document. And so, um, think about this. Have you dealt with people that everyone needed to collaborate on a project? And then you're emailing the document back and forth and someone messes it up. Or someone goes out of sync that they're typing something and now their version is behind someone else's version. Something like Google Drive. 
where collaborative documents exist, I can start this document, send it to everyone on the team, have everyone work on it, just like I'm having you work on it, and then I can go in and turn that off. I can then stop everyone collaborating on it. But it was simply following a link. I created a link, which I'll show you how in a moment, and gave you all the ability to edit the document, because I can change it to let people simply view the document, edit, or comment on the document. We'll see that in a moment. But here then, I'm giving everyone the access to this file, and we're all collaborating on it. We have to be careful that we don't step on each other's toes. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if we're all doing it at the same time, that's, that's more of a possibility. If I'm working with people at their own time schedule, someone's in New York, someone's in LA, you know, we're not going to be stepping on each other's lines with that time zone. But here, obviously, everyone at the same time, it could happen. And anyone can do anything that they want here. Anonymous ferret, be careful, you're typing gibberish. And um, so we all have the ability to edit everything here. Uh, me, because I'm the, the ruler of it, yeah. I can then go in and say... That's one weird thing. Um, it's supposed to show you your name if you're logged in. I'm not sure why it's making everyone anonymous at the moment. Um, I don't like it if I can see. Oh, anonymous error. Anonymous error at the top. Hmm. See those at the top there? That's yeah. what I mean. So right now what I did was I changed the editing rules. If you click inside of it, can you edit anymore? No, no. no but what you do have is comment. You do have the comment on the right side. You have this little add comment. So you can do that. You have that comment item there. So it's not going to edit the original file over here. It's going to give commenting suggestions. So try that. Try clicking on the right side somewhere here and then click add comment and add a comment instead. You mean click on what says comments there? Next to it? You do not have permission. Yeah, I don't have permission. Yeah, so we don't have permission to add comments. Oh really? Yeah. You have it. Yeah. I, I highlighted your name by mistake and it said to me, but I didn't need to read it. I can add a comment. Yeah, I like, I like. Try highlighting something and then adding the comment. I'm highlighting the name. Yeah, I said that. And then I can't, yes. Some of you do. I don't know, it, it might be slow to give you access or something, but it's supposed to. Um, looks, I think you can edit your own stuff, but then for everything else, it's. Try to select it and then. I can edit. You can edit? Yeah. I added uh, some gibberish after trying to sing. Yeah, I can't see it. I do that. But it says but something in red about. access granted, though. Mm -hmm. No, it's not really on the screen. Oh, no, I'm not on there. My sitting on this bad. So let's see, I put it on anyone can comment, but then it didn't do exactly what I thought. Well, that's okay. I'm just uh, here, this is worst case scenario, you know, bedlam. But if I uh, were doing this with my, with my team, I could set up these options. But I can, I can still go back and instead change it over to can view. Now, if I put it on can view, I don't believe you'll be able to do anything with it. Can you do anything now? Still you still can. Google, you're making me look bad. Yeah. So Google is, uh, maybe it doesn't happen right away. Maybe you have to close oh, it. Okay. I don't know. Now. Now I'm <laughs> okay. So where does it put the comments? Along the side? Where do these comments appear? Yeah, I see them right there on the side. Okay, they're right there. So right now I've deactivated. You can only view it. So this is another thing you could do with this. I'll show you how to do this in a moment, but this is the concept. I started this document. I want people to add to it so I can have these different levels. Simply view it, in theory, is supposed to be that you can only view it. You can't make changes. Comment is that you're not supposed to be able to edit anything in the main body over here. 
um, and then you can add a comment on the edge. So in theory, that's supposed to be that if someone adds a comment to fix something, I then approve it and change it and, and whatever. And then of course the most open is that the document is completely editable by everyone. And then anyone can log in and then make changes and it should, if this is all good, it should then know that it's you. It shouldn't be anonymous. Uh, I don't know why sometimes it's anonymous and sometimes it's not. But that's the point of this. We have these different people on the team. They'll be marked here. Here apparently there is anonymous pumpkin. He ran out of animals. Um, but everyone can then collaborate and I can go in and see all the comments and who edited and how they made changes. So I do see comments at the top right for me. I don't know if you see the same thing. But at the top right under comments, I see what everyone did here. And I can reply to people too. I, what, I, what I can also do, try this. What about if you go to the file menu? Do you see revision history or only me? Do you see the revision it's history? It's out. Yeah, I see it's out. OK. So me, because I created the document, it looks like I'm the one that has this access. And I go to File, Revision History, and this will pop up here, everything that's been done with the document, and I can actually go back in time and revert to changes. So if I didn't like something that was edited, I can go back to, it's like an undo, I can go back to these previous revisions and bring the revision back. Okay, so I'm showing you the result of this. Let me show you how to do this. Any questions before I move on to that? Can you see my comments? No. Uh, not anymore. Did, well, did you? Did it might not have synchronized yet. I don't see it yet. But I did deact. I have comments deactivated for a couple minutes now, so it might not actually take. So in order for us to, um, to, for you to learn how to do this, let, let me show you that. Uh, I've got a few tabs open on top here. I'm going to go back to my tab, go back to your tab of your Google Drive. And I'm curious about this. I'm curious here. Go back to your tab. If you close your tab, it's simply drive.google.com. Go back to your, your drive. and. Go we'll look at shared with me. For some of you, I think they will show up here, and for some, not for some reason. Go to your shared with me and raise your hand if you do see my file in your shared folder. So this is supposed to have a repository um, where if you, if I shared a file with you, it'll show up there. If it doesn't, that's okay. If it doesn't, that's okay. So um, what we're going to do then is we're going to, I'm going to show you then how to sh share a document. Let's say you, you wrote your, your first Google Doc a little while ago, right? Um, it should be in your list here. So on your Google Doc file, right-click it. And this time we'll look at the share box. We looked at get link a moment ago. Instead, this document, I want to share it with people with extra options. So right click it and share. Your document. Right click it and share it. You get this pop up. There's a few ways to do it. Enter names or email addresses. So if I've got my address book on my Gmail, and I want to send this directly to people, individual people. I put in their email address here, and it'll send it to them. I can add a note, and it'll say, can edit, comment, or view. So this is one way. It's not that convenient, because I need to type in everyone's um, I need to type in everyone's name here manually, and I don't have a sort of distribution list like I can do 
in, in Outlook where I can say send this to all 70 of these people. So from this screen here it's not that useful, I hardly use this. Instead what I do is up here on the top right, instead of putting people's addresses here, click get shareable link. You get this screen here, shareable link is on, so you can turn it on or off, but it's on, and it says anyone with this link can view, can comment, can edit, or just turn this off. Actually, they don't want a shareable link. Can view, can comment, can edit. So if I select edit, that link right there, I can distribute that link on an email, on Twitter, on a text message, so that's very similar to what we saw with simply get link. But here we've set it to can edit, can comment, or can view. I'm going to click done. I can keep coming back to that screen. Share. And it'll know what you did. So that's what I did before the break. I created a document. I went to share right here. I changed it to can edit and I copied that link into the network folder. I gave you that shared doc. Then you all accessed it and now we're able to get into my document. While I had the document open and you were all connected to it, I have at the top right the share options. So if you did share your document and people have access to it, I then within the document have a share button and I can go back to it the same way here and say, okay, no more, no more editing, just comments. No more comments, just viewing. So that share feature can be very powerful. You saw that it's relatively easy to set up any of your documents or folders. You can do it to the whole folder as well. You can get that share link. And that one's only edit or view, no comment. So if you do this for a folder, this is very cool because for the whole folder, you can get the shareable link, can edit, and now you can have your friends and family add to that folder they will be able to upload their pictures of their view of the vacation. I have this vacation 2015 folder with my 10 pictures, but then the other people in my family, I can share this link with them, I can change it to anyone can edit, and now they'll be able to upload their pictures. Once I'm done taking their pictures, I can change it back to view, and then share that link with everyone in the family. This is awesome. You don't have to buy that for that's right yeah and, and it's it's really good it's uh, you know very powerful and very free yeah that is the big downside Now we have a few more advanced things that we can do here. So let's say I'm back on this share screen and we have the, the three basic shares. We also have more. Under more, we have the option of sharing is on public. Anyone on the internet can find and access no sign-in required. So this is like the most open. This is like leaving your front door unlocked and open. Number one here. The second one is leaving your front door unlocked. Not open. If they know that it's open, they can come in. And then the third one is off ah, specific people. So that's like having your door locked, but you give people copies of the key. That's in settings? No, that's under here when you when you're looking at can can edit and you go to more. So if you want something completely open, 
for someone to do a Google search and find, that's the option there. You hardly need that. But if you do, it's there. So you've got a few extra options there. And then from here, you can do can edit, comment, or view. So if you put this out, let's say you wrote a great paper on the effects of whatever, uh, whatever. So you then publish it completely, completely open, open to a Google search, and people can comment. That could be a way to get public comment on some, some document or your work or your essay or your short story. You could do that. You can write short stories, publish them, be a self-publisher right here on Google Drive, put it open, and when someone is searching for, you know, scary stories 2016 on Google, yours could appear because it's completely open to be found by search engines. And then have it that people can comment or view. Probably not edit, because that'll be chaos. And it should be here, no sign-in required. So you don't need a Google account to be able to view, comment, or edit. And there's also advanced. Within that same screen, I backed out, instead of being in that more box, just in this main sharing screen here, I have advanced in the corner. So here's a quick way to send it via Gmail, post on Google+, Facebook, or Twitter. I can take my link here and tweet it. I have to sign into Twitter, but I can send it directly to Twitter there. Does it shorten it to... Yeah. Twitter automatically shortens it anyway, and it doesn't matter shortening it on Facebook or Google+. And what I'm doing here is I'm tweeting this link that anyone can edit it. Uh, before that, I'll just set it that people can, uh, can comment on it, and then I'll tweet it. That's under Advanced. And then under Advanced, Disable option to download, print, and copy for commenters and viewers. So if I want to put this out public for people to give comments, I don't want them to get a copy of it for their own purposes. Prevent editors from changing access and adding new people. <coughs> if you give people the ability to edit, actually you've also given them the ability to add more people that can edit it. If you don't want your editors to add more editors, you can turn that option off. But you probably gave them editing options because you trust them. If you don't, turn that on. <coughs> so this is one of the big reasons why I think Google Drive and other cloud solutions like this are really nice because collaboration. You can create documents and share them to various degrees. And when you're working in a team, this is very invaluable because email quickly breaks down, sending something back and forth. So that's sharing. Any questions on that before we move on? We can share documents we've uploaded or created, and I was showing an example of sharing a word processor document. But if you go back to the New button, we'll briefly look at the other kinds. For example, Sheets. Let's take a quick look at Sheets. We can click New Google Sheets. get a spreadsheet. You get the spreadsheet where you can track data and make charts and stuff. That's nice. But um, what you can do is, I didn't show it in Word, but you'll see the same thing here. I mean in, in Docs. Here in the spreadsheet, we also have templates. We started with a blank, plain document on Google Docs. We have a plain spreadsheet here. You can start with templates as well. If you click on the top left corner, you see here you've got this sort of um, spreadsheet icon. Click on that icon there. It takes you to like the 
parent screen. And we have a blank document. We can create a, a calendar. This is a calendar that can be a spreadsheet. A to-do list, an annual budget, a monthly budget. All of this is powered by spreadsheets. And with spreadsheets, we can add up figures, get averages, make charts, all of that math stuff. So let's say I want to make this monthly budget. So this is a free template. It's a spreadsheet. I have to fill in my items here, starting balance. It'll then do calculations. I fill in how much am I planning and planned and actual. Very cool. So I have here this monthly, this monthly budget, which then I can click on the top right share with the other people in my family so that everyone can collaborate on it. Yes. For um, the spreadsheet stuff, can you still do a collaborative uh, document? Yeah, with any of these things that we create um, up here with uh, docs, spreadsheets, slides, they can all be collaborative. Okay, so if I had created a new Google Doc, on Google Doc I also have that Doc icon on the top left, and that's full of templates as well. Resume. So I can get this started off. I have that for Google Docs, Google Spreadsheets, and the third one is then the, the PowerPoint analog presentation. Within any of these documents, I can go to File, New, and I have it there quickly also. Presentation. So here I get a PowerPoint compatible presentation tool, various themes. I can also go back up to the templates here, and I get this great photo album. Never really heard of a wedding PowerPoint, but I guess you could. Pitch. Oh, okay. Okay, now I get it. So, so here I did pitch. This is really interesting because it automatically creates this template for you to, to do a pitch meeting. Our mission is blah, blah, blah. Here's the problem, the solution, all of that. And then just like real PowerPoint, I can turn on presentation mode. And here, I'll go slide to slide, right from the web browser. Downside, of course, is I need a web browser. I need internet access. But with any of these, I can go to File, Download, and then the appropriate type of document will be created. So I can create a Microsoft PowerPoint compatible document. or PDF and such.
Okay, so those would be the three main types of Office documents that you might need to create. All of them can be collaborative, all of them can get that share link where people can add to the document. Notice I have been playing around and I've just created a bunch of types of documents just like any sort of um, files on my computer I can manage them and if you've got the get if you've got the Google Drive for your computer it works the opposite way too I work on any documents in the cloud and they will automatically download and synchronize to my local computer so I can start my project here on the computer lab saves automatically and when I go home in my little Google Drive folder in the corner here I can just open it and the document is there waiting for me. Oh, so they sync. They sync wherever from up to the cloud or down from the cloud. So they should not be on your phone too. Exactly. If you've got it on your phone, you've got it on your phone too. So let's say here I've been working with these documents and actually I don't need this document anymore, this pitch, this spreadsheet you can right click and we've got remove or simply click it and then delete on the keyboard but if you right click remove you can delete it so here it gets deleted you can undo it if you made a mistake but there's still also one intermediary step before it really goes away just like on my computer here I've got this uh, I've got the recycle bin if I delete something it doesn't really go away it's temporarily there or on the Mac it goes to the trash can on Google Drive it also doesn't automatically go away even though I pressed remove and it's a little trash can it just goes away over to the trash if you don't see it right away here it might have uh, you're, you might need to scroll here, but there is also a trash. So when you remove something, you go there. These are the files I deleted today and other days. They're all still there. If I if from there I really want to get rid of them, from here I have to do one more right-click delete forever. But these sorts of documents will take a very little space. Um, I've had this for feels like seven, eight, nine, ten years. I don't know how long, but I've had a Google Drive for a long time, and I hardly delete things because you're not going to run out of you're, you're not going to run out of space with those kinds of files. You will with pictures and videos, but not PowerPoints or Word docs and such. And if you did make a mistake and you want to bring it back, you've also got Restore, where you can just drag it out of the folder, out of the trash folder. If this is just like folders on your desktop, you can also click and drag to select multiple files. So here I'm selecting multiple files. Click and drag. I can delete them all. So obviously we've been talking all of this time about and, and seeing how great this is, very convenient, very useful. You then have to decide, do you want to continue to use it? Do you trust the company? Not just Google, because Microsoft has a version. Not just Microsoft, Apple has a version. Amazon has a version. They've all got a version. And it is the Wild West at the moment. And um, I haven't heard really that for the big ones like this, that, that people have broken in and stolen things, I have heard that sometimes the service is down and such. With Dropbox, I do believe I heard something uh, like five or years ago, four years ago, that suddenly for like five minutes, all passwords were deactivated. Something like that. Um, so that stuff does happen once in a while. Uh, has anyone heard of any of negative stuff happening with these, de with these services? Frequently, hear of things where they have little outages. Outages, I yeah. Think they just are like 
on targets for attack. Yeah. The hackers, you know, it has so much valuable data. Outages possibly. What about anyone breaking in and seeing everyone's files? Any, any stories about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the phone. Yeah, the Apple phone. Pictures. Yeah. From all the like stores, compromised. They have like compromising pictures. Yeah. Exactly. So, that was the big one that happened recently. Definitely, that was that was. Uh, I forgot what I forgot what vulnerability it was, but some way it it did. Uh, it did. They compromised it, and sort of. I mean, people have like you know pictures they were taking. Yeah. What else to say? Exactly. So, that's uh, that's the good and the bad. It's very convenient, but um, security is still being worked out and. Everything is is un, is insecure online. Basically, you just have to take precautions. Even even your mail is insecure. Someone could walk by your mailbox, reach in, and walk out with it. So, are you going to trust that? You're not going to use the mail anymore. Yes. Someone said to me we were talking, we were debating this subject with a group of people, and they their contention was that any pictures that you put up there were like red stories where like someone had their family photos up online somewhere, and then like later on in like April, they saw them at their that that it depends if you're uploading family photos over to Instagram or Facebook or Flickr and such yeah that's gonna happen probably because um, in the fine print when you use those photo services they're they're gonna say something like you allow us to use some of your content for marketing purposes. Okay. So for Instagram and, and those kinds of ones, Flickr, it was a big deal a few, uh, a year ago or so, Flickr had changed it so that if you had uploaded your photos public, they could be found in a, in a, in the stock images search, something like that, by default, and people didn't like that, so I think they changed it. Okay. Uh, so, so one of these though, no, this is your private files. Right, or if you have like a website, mm -hmm. Yeah, a website too, but then that's going against a lot of other safeguards. Uh, anything that you put online, basically, uh, especially the more public it is, the less you should be surprised if it gets abused, unfortunately. That's how it is. So basically, if you're uploading your, your photos and you're trying to make money off of your photos, in theory, your photos could get stolen and redistributed and you could lose some money. I would do it this way. I would create a Google Drive or an or a OneDrive account, keep it all private except for those that you allow, uh, and you should not have then any problem with them using your photos for commercial purposes because it's private. If, you, if that doesn't quite matter, you can use Flickr or Instagram, but those will, could be, could be used publicly. So, in theory, the more options that you have turned on of privacy, the more it should not be used for those purposes. And there's also the classic way, burn it on a CD and mail it, but highly inconvenient. Yeah. Did you get that CD yet? Yeah, that's coming up right now. So, yes. I had a, a little thing. Uh, one of my teachers recently went to the post office box, and uh, this mother told her son, hey, go put this in the post office box. And he walks up to the box, and he's looking at it like, you know, how do I open this? What do I do? Huh. He walks back to his mom, and he's like, <laughs> How does it work? Yeah, because you know, kids are used to email, text messages, they don't go to post offices. You know? Yeah, it's really changing. So, this a few years ago was unheard of, uh, saving your files online. Um, and what will the last thing that we'll close on is also one of the newest, most interesting things or maybe valuable things that you can do. If you go up to new, hidden under more, we've got Google Forms, not forums, forms which are ways to get feedback. So this is very valuable. If I had planned this out a little better, I would have created a feedback form to give all of you guys to get back some feedback about the class. But we'll explore this. Go ahead and click up on New, More, 
Google Forms, and there's also ones we're not going to get to, such as Google Drawings. This is a little basic drawing program up here. And you can save locations on Google Maps that you want to get info about. But go to Google Forms, and the way this works is you design a form, as we'll see right now, and then you can publish it privately or publicly, and then get feedback. And then this will collect the feedback, and it'll make charts about your results and all of that. So let's see what we've got here. This is very cool. This is, um, it's telling me try the new Google Forms. I haven't seen it yet, but let's try it because probably the new one is going to take over eventually. Might as well know the, learn the new one. So do you also get a little bar at the top that says try the new Google Forms? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you do, go ahead and click it. When you're on Drive right here, click New, and then at the bottom click More, Google Forms. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the new forms. Take a tour. Uh, let me see it quickly there. Add questions, themes up there, options, responses. Okay. Well, the way this works is you, you have this untitled form. All of this is being saved to your Google Drive, so you can always get back to it. And here's the design view. We can design the questions and we can see the responses. So first thing, we've got untitled form and form description. So, just to make this up, uh, untitled form. I'm going to click there. I'm going to call it um, Advanced Google Class Feedback. I can add a description. Please take a moment to tell us how you enjoyed the class. So, I can create a form to take back to, to get feedback from, from anything. I, I hold some sort of event and then I send out an email to everyone on the list asking for some feedback. This is similar but not as powerful as, as uh, SurveyMonkey. Have you heard of that? Yes. SurveyMonkey. So SurveyMonkey is a website where you create feedback forms. There's the free version and the paid version. I believe even the free version is, is more powerful than this one. But this is still very good to start off with. So um, then we've got here, untitled question. The new design of Google makes it not obvious sometimes where to click. But if you click in the area of untitled question, here's our first question. And this particular one is set to multiple choice. You can change the kind of question to different kinds, but I'll start with multiple choice questions. So first, how did you hear about the class. Option one, and we can add as many as we want, or simply other, where a person can fill in their own items. So option one, radio. Add another option, TV. Print, web. Those might not be the only forms of communication that you found out about our class. Maybe you saw the skywriting we did. So I'm going to put here other. A person can choose other. If I actually don't want a particular item, I can click the X on the right to remove it. And I can rearrange these by clicking and dragging on this left little six button area and just drag it up here. Now, creating useful forms and such is a whole art and science because depending on how you organize your questions, you might already create a bias and people will keep answering the same first one because it's the first one. So you have various features um, like randomizing the order. It's not obvious sometimes, but notice here. This question, I want to make it random so that it's not always web number one. Because I might get a bias. I might get a lot of responses being web because it's the first one. And if I've got 40 questions, by the time someone is on question 20, they're going to be fatigued already. They're just going to click, they're going to click through it. So again, this is a whole art and science of creating forms. Don't ask 20 questions. Don't ask 40 questions. Keep it really short. 10 questions. Maybe send out multiple forms. But Keep it simple. And what I'm saying here about randomness 
If you click on the bottom right corner of these options, these are options of this question. You're probably in the old design, that's okay. Uh, I'll check what yours looks like in one moment. But uh, here, I can like shuffle option to order. So every time a person visits my question here, they'll get a different <coughs> order. They won't rearrange it here, but when they visit it, they'll get a different order. So this, but this really isn't a form, like where say I wanted to have a, a client sign a waiver. I can't type something and have them fill it out. Like there's no, it's not a form, it's really a survey. I don't see any other options than questions. You're right in that sense that to some degree it's not exactly a form for... Uh, I was going to get to it one moment, but this is going to be... You can add multiple kinds of elements. But I'll show that in a moment. But yes, in theory, this is a little bit more toward a survey rather than an actual form, like a client, you know, some sort of client form to, to land a new client. Yeah, we can use some aspects of it, though, depending on the kind of question we ask. Right now we got the basic multiple choice question. But notice here then on the right side, let me ask a new question. When you click on that, it gives you a new question, multiple choice, but then from here, I can then have people give me a short answer, or write a paragraph, or fill in check boxes, such as, click here to approve that we're going to use your likeness checkbox. So no, it's not like a real kind of client form. It could be used in that way. It's a little bit more leaning towards surveys. Um, yes? You know, like they have a, like you said, it might be used email on your website. Can you use this as a contact form? This can be used as a contact form, yes. You have in a few of these like short answers the question is what's your email and they'll put in their email and then another short answer I mean this time a paragraph what's your comment and then they can fill in a comment so let's try that uh, you can click on the little plus to add a new question and then I'm gonna change the question just to try this out to short answer. So then this is going to require um, short answer such as uh, what is your industry? So then that doesn't require a lot of text. The person can then simply reply what their industry is. That data will be collected. All of this will be automatically collected and put into our responses screen right here, which is basically a spreadsheet. I can reorganize these questions by dragging that, that little gripper item to different, different ones. So take a moment add another question and maybe play with one of these different ones instead of multiple choice. Well, what's this linear scale? Try some of these different ones and let's see what options you Bureaucrats 
it. It's, if you're doing that on HTML, yes, there's definitely that out there. But if you're doing it for here, no, you're doing it manually. Uh -huh. <coughs> So let's say I'm going with linear scale. My question is here, how interested were you in the subject? Scale of 1 to 5. And I can label it 1 is not interested, 5 is very interested. So that's how people can fill in that. I can, of course, make it go to different levels. I can go from 0 to 5 or 1 to 10. And on each of these questions, I have also the ability to duplicate. If I'm going to ask a very similar question next, instead of retyping it and such, I can click that duplicate button. It'll give me the same question, which then I can alter. I can trash that question if actually I don't want to ask it. And then we've got required. None of them are required at the moment, so everyone can just click, can just skip all of them and click submit, and you get no responses. If I say you have to answer this question before going to the next one, you um, you activate required. From the options here, you might also say hint text. That's just a little bit of extra text that will appear, sort of like explaining the question. It's not on by default, so if your question is explanatory enough, you don't need it. But if you need that hint, you can activate it, and then you'll say one extra bit of text here. That is hidden inside of the, the three dots here. Hint text. Well, I can add a video. That's pretty new. Yeah, now you can add a video. Some of these have extra options, such as data validation. What if you're trying to capture a specific kind of data? So I put, what's your industry? Data validation. Number is greater than text, regular, greater than. Yeah, so this can be text contains, doesn't contain. Text is an email address. So that's how you can force someone to put an email address here. Say, so what's your email address? And then uh, I've said it's going to be text. It's got to be an email address. And if they write something wrong, what's the error that pops up for them? Not everyone has this data validation. For example, the scale here, it only has hint text. That's it. But this one that I wrote as text, it needed validation. Right now I've added three questions, and they're going to be part of one long web page. That might be annoying. I want, to answer, I want to ask one question at a time. One screen, one question. So what I would need to do is actually create sections. This, this last icon right here, this is basically I add a section. So I'm going to ask the first question, I add a section, and then the next question. So one screen here. When that one is submitted, then the next screen shows the next question. So you add these sections. So there's section one of two, first question. They, f they answer this, they click submit. After section one, continue to the next section, section two. I can get very complex here. I've made some complex ones where based on the answer you jump to someplace else it can be very complex. It doesn't have to be linear. I can create a bunch of these questions and then playing with after this section guide them elsewhere or within the question here this one says go to section based on answer. So I can have seven questions that will then follow up on web and two questions that will follow up on print based on second. That's pretty complex because I have to create multiple sections, multiple questions, and then from section to section, link it together so that it goes to the right questions. I 
I can embed a video. I haven't seen this one myself yet, but... I don't have that. Section based on answer. It's going to depend on the on the question, on definitely, the on the form. If it's multiple choice, that's usually how that will appear. Actually, even do like a, a, like a small training. Yeah. Yeah, you could even do quizzes here, trainings. So you have them watch a video and then at the uh, here mm -hmm. ask the question, which of these methods is the right way to install the server? And then they choose the option, and then based on those, wrong answer goes there and right answer goes there. I think that's pushing the limits of what this can do. There's be, there's definitely other software that'll do th that better, but that's a way to do it. And whatever way you share this, it's always going to be a link, like if you're emailing it or putting it on Facebook or putting it on the website, you're going to say, you're going to have, it's going to be just a link. Yes, right? it's just a link. You can no. also embed it as well, too. Without you to embed it also on the website. Um, yeah, that, that is true then. Uh, you can send the link directly to people, or you can, in here somewhere, it'll give you the code to embed it directly on your website. Are you sure that how you found that email? Like, I the email? What did I do? Oh, okay, yes, right here. Um, where did the question go? So I've got... I put it on short answer and then on the options button at the bottom right I select the data validation. So then data validation, the rules are this needs to be text needs to be an email address. And it will only accept email addresses. How do you do read sections? Is that the kind of Five sections with his own three questions. Okay. So we can explore a lot of these other questions and such, but <clears throat> uh, how does that actually look like to people? If you send them the link, you can click that preview button on the top. If you click that little eyeball at the top, that's how it actually looks to people. And it might not be so obvious, but when you click that view, that preview, this that it shows you is also the address. It'll, uh, you will see that address to our link in another way in a moment, but this address up here is also the address to that form. So if you copy and paste that address on an email or share it via social media, this is another way to get this form out there. This is a link to the form. We've got send. So let's say we've designed our form, we need feedback. So on the form itself, I click send. This is okay. Send it to Twitter, social media, send it to individuals via email. 
and collaborators to help you edit it. A user can submit only one response. Basically, if the person has the link to this form, they can fill it out 10 times to skew the results. But if you activate only one at a time, it will require the person to log in with their Gmail. So if that's okay, if that extra step for your feedback is okay, then turn that on and you'll get purer results. Uh, I'm just kind of thinking it in the worst case scenario. Not having that on will allow a person to fill their form in 10 times. And if you're doing some sort of contest and letting multiple people add multiple <coughs> input to that, you can have one person with 10 entries to your contest. If you do it that way, it will know that that one person filled your form out one time tied to their Gmail, which this requires a login. Where did you get the send button? Well, there's a send button on the top right, and then you have that option. I can send this via email, then I've got link. There's the link that I showed earlier. I can also shorten it so that it doesn't look so cumbersome, although that really doesn't matter nowadays. That's another place to get the web link. You can get it when you preview it, or you can get it from here. And lastly here we've got embed. So we can take this code, and it's not obvious. Google's new design really is not obvious sometimes. But here you can um, change the size of your Of your, of your form. So if you take this line of code and paste it into your blog, your website, whatever, it will then have this form on your site and it'll be live, it'll be active, it will be collecting your data. And at the moment, perhaps all of our designs look exactly the same. Let's look at this. You've got this color palette. This is color. It's not really a design. It's Google's new style, big, bold colors. You can't put a background picture. You can put the little picture there. You can't. Yeah, the last icon there, that picture. What was the other form uh, you mentioned? Survey Monkey. So I do have all of these built in kinds of designs. Here's Here's your, here's your birthday form. How did you like Billy's birthday party? So you can even make like an online wedding invitation. Yeah. An invitation for a party. So let's say this was all filled out and you sent it and it's public, then you would when you come back to Google when you come back to Google Drive to check your your data days or hours later, 
You come back to Google Drive and you will have a new item here in your Google Drive. It's a form. So you can go back to, act, to edit the form again, or probably what you want to do is, once you go back to your form, you want to see responses. I don't have any responses here, but it's going to show me responses, and what I can do is download that, download the data as a spreadsheet, delete it so I can start, so I can start over with responses, or I can say no more responses. I can turn that off. Now, even if people follow the link, they will not be able to, will not be able to answer anything and that, that's editable. So the message there, if you say, sorry, we are no longer accepting applicants. So we can turn that on. Yeah. Actually, previous line of answer to all questions. That's pretty cool if you have charts. It does. Yeah, I don't have any data to show, but that when when I do, it's very impressive because then it shows you charts and, and all your data, and uh, that's useful to visualize people's responses. So actually, we're going to need to start to wrap it up now. But any any final questions then about forms? I would explore them. They they can be complicated if you make them complicated, if you need to make them complicated, or they can be pretty straightforward. And that's a way to collect data for free. It's all part of the, the, your, your Google account, and that's what this whole class was, advanced Google, using, <laughs> using what we take for granted. It's not just Google Search or Gmail. We've got Google Plus for social media, traffic to your website. We've got YouTube, another form of SEO and traffic to your website. We've got Webmaster Tools and Analytics to, to check the efficacy of your efforts online, and then we've got docs, uh, collaborative documents or feedback forms. Any big questions, general questions about the class? Um, as we wrap up, I want to mention two things. Usually what I do at the end of a course, if you are able to, I would appreciate some feedback. I don't have a feedback form for you. But uh, if you search Rate My Professor, Victor Campos, you'll find my Rate My Professor profile there, where you can give someone anonymous feedback. You can, you can rate the class, give me some feedback, and it's very useful for me because it helps me improve my classes. Uh, you have to be careful here because I have an account with San Diego Continuing Education, which is here, and Southwestern College, which is not here. So if you're going to give me any sort of feedback, please do so for San Diego Continuing Education. And if it asks you for a class number, our class number is 5949C, simply Advanced Google. So you can search me there, add some feedback, and... Um, it's anonymous, but it's it's helpful. And the other thing that I that I humbly ask for, also, if you would like to, which thing? Five nine four nine C. What I also ask is if you're on Facebook, if you could give my. Facebook company page alike, facebook.com slash PND Interactive, and or you can also give a like at facebook.com slash instructor Victor C. So on either of those, if you give a like, that's also appreciated. You can give a review on Rate My Professors or Facebook. Or follow on Twitter or Google Plus, whatever. We're all, it's PMD Interactive on, on everything. But uh, we'll wrap up. We'll have a little bit of lab time. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning of the day the classes that you might be interested in. See me if you want to see those again. Thank you for coming, and hopefully you learned a few cool advanced Google things.